please allow me to welcome our next presenter or next panelist, Professor Michael Hinner. Uh, who is joining us from Freiburg, the Technische Akademie, um, Technische Universität, Berg Akademie Freiburg. Saxony. Saxony. Not, not Black Forest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who is with us for um, several years now. He's a very active and yet a member. His research interests involve interculturality, of course, but uh, of course many other uh, uh, areas, including um, business business communication, business English, and many other fields. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Michael, who will tell us about attitudes and tolerance or intolerance. Is there a, a, a relationship? Michael, over to you. Okay, thank you, Satana. Okay, uh, I won't wait too much, so I'm going to try to sort of <coughs> pick out the highlights. Uh, after we sort of heard uh, presentation about uh, identity in the context also of uh, nations. I want to now shift the focus down to the individual person and take a look at how attitudes are created, influenced, and is there a possibility of changing attitudes, what needs to be done. But in order to do so, um, let me just, let me see, uh, yeah, okay, good. Uh, I was going to sort of talk a little bit about perception. Uh, I'll try to just highlight it. Uh, and then I really need to focus a bit on identity. This is though uh, the uh, personal identity and then jump to attitudes. And uh, I want to look at uh, stereotypes, prejudices, how they're formed and then uh, looking at what some researchers um, have revealed about overcoming stereotypes and prejudices. Uh, interestingly enough, in uh, human communication, uh, they usually end up talking about attitudes, stereotypes, and prejudices, racism, uh, but there's almost no mention of tolerance or intolerance, which is interesting. So, uh, uh, yes. so. Okay, perception, um, in a sense, is um, uh, talking about us being exposed to a set of sensory stimuli, and uh, we select very typically um, uh, very specific uh, sensory stimuli. I'm going to sort of pick this up again and again. This, uh, these stimuli have to be organized uh, in order to make sense. Now, um, some end the perception at this point. Others add the element of, well, after it's been organized, we need to sort of make sense of what we've organized and try to sort of also come up with an evaluation, a judgment. And um, some other researchers also um, treat this as a separate stage. We talk about storage. In some ways, it's uh, identical to what other researchers coming from a, a different direction uh, refer to the organization of those sensory stimuli. And then the retrieval. This is uh, quite uh, important when we are talking about attitudes and also stereotypes because we are usually uh, drawing on uh, past information in a current situation. So it's a combination of what we remember, how we are remembering it, how we are recalling it, and how we are, in a sense, applying it at a specific moment in time. This in turn uh, results in a new impression which then gets stored again in our memory and then will be retrieved at a future time. So it's a sort of ongoing chain process. Uh, interestingly enough, or maybe not surprisingly enough, the negative experiences tend to be remembered more, lots of psychological research shows us, than positive experiences. We tend to sort of accept them. We, since we usually expect something good to happen, uh, we take that for granted, whereas if we had expected something good, I always tell my students, you know, uh, having high expectations for passing the exam and then having a negative in, uh, uh, experience once they get the results tends to stick in their minds and then I'm always the bad person because they sort of remember this. Okay, identity. Here, um, uh, in, in psychology, there's usually a reference to uh, 
self-image and self-esteem. And it might be interesting to take a look at this. Uh, they're, they're very, very closely related, and if you sort of read the literature, it seems to be overlapping. Self-image is how an individual sees herself or himself, whereas self-esteem is about how a person perceives herself or himself. Seeing and then perceiving and feeling about this as well. So this is um, uh, very closely related. Uh, in a sense, the um, maybe I'll just sort of for the sake of time. Quite interesting. Uh, some psychologists refer to also when they're talking about self-image, they're talking about uh, self-schema, and um, here they are also referring to those traits and details of what a person sort of uh, has uh, or uses to describe. Uh, herself or himself, and uh, they are usually organized in a particular way, the so-called self-referential coding, and uh, this organization uh, represents a coherent scheme, a program. This is uh, coherent uh, in a subjective way for the individual. So what one person may consider to be a coherent scheme, someone else may not consider to be. We have to be aware of this. Now, it turns out that uh, there is considerable uh, research in psychology as well as also in uh, human communication, especially in interpersonal communication, that shows that people who have a poor self-image uh, tend to exhibit poor self-worth, and uh, there is a potential, this is already discovered by uh, Rogers, Kuiper Kirker in 77 uh, has a potential for social disorder. Uh, Fine and Spencer revealed that people with a negative self image uh, tend to use stereotyping and prejudice to maintain their self image. They feel sort of less worth than others, so uh, uh, they like to sort of degrade others, and in a sense, use this to sort of lift themselves up. This was um, um, demonstrated also by the research of uh, Florak, uh, Skarapis, and Gos Johan, and uh, they conclude that uh, people tend to use uh, uh, stereotyping and prejudice to essentially restore their own self-esteem. And uh, again, not surprisingly, negative feedback. In other words, uh, when someone is told something negative by another person, uh, being presented with negative feedback or negative information tends to threaten someone's uh, self esteem and self image. And consequently, uh, there is probably going to be an attempt by this person who perceives to be threatened by negative feedback to in turn then uh, also present some more negative feedback. So we're creating sort of a chain here, spiral essentially just going down. Uh, again, uh, self-esteem, how you, uh, well, you like it, uh, someone likes him or herself, it has an influence, and here again, high self-esteem uh, indicates that these are the people who are uh, more likely to actually be proactive when it comes to communication versus someone who has low self-esteem. And um, what's also quite interesting is this, uh, that uh, someone with high self-esteem is able to take criticism better than someone with low self-esteem. So uh, the, uh, people with high self-esteem usually have no problems dealing with criticism, whereas uh, someone with low self-esteem, the exact opposite. Uh, so here we have then sort of this problem as far as sort of uh, someone's identity or personality, you want to call it that, which 
in a sense, um, was uh, developed uh, through interaction with uh, other people. Obviously, as a child, grows up with parents, with, uh, with uh, peers. So it uh, becomes part of someone's identity, and this is going to make this quite difficult. But people who have both a low uh, self-esteem and um, have a negative self-perception are going to be probably, as far as the psychological evidence is showing, going to be prone to be using stereotypes and, uh, and uh, prejudice, possibly also racism. And it's going to be difficult to change someone because this is part of who they are. So um, topical uh, approaches and strategies to sort of have people overcome certain stereotypes are going to probably not work. Right. So we, we can say then, uh, in a sense then, those who are important to us, this is important, uh, obviously if the parents are not important then they're not going to play an important role. If uh, some uh, brothers and sisters are not important to me or teachers are not important to me, they're not going to have any influence. But uh, it is those people who are important to me uh, and they have a positive image of me, um, it will have a positive impact. Therefore, we can sort of say that um, identity is a social construct that is created over time. It is subjective. And um, meaning is given to it uh, through interaction with other people. So in a sense, we can again sort of summarize and say that identity is created, reflected, maintained through interactions with people. Even though people continue throughout their lives to undergo change, uh, once an identity is in place, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to change. It is possible to do that. Let me sort of skip through this a little bit. Uh, okay, uh, let's move to just ethnocentrism. Uh, what's interesting here is is that uh, again, uh, sort of we take our culture as uh, the focal point. Uh, culture is an important aspect, of course, also of identity. And um, what is the case here is is that uh, if you grow up within a culture and you accept the culture, again, you're not having sort of a negative uh, experience with this. Uh, then uh, you tend to believe that the values of your culture seem natural. And if someone in another culture does things differently or holds different values, then compared to your standard, it's going to appear odd and wrong. Uh, what's very important here is then this, this idea of in and out groups we tend to associate ourselves with specific in-groups. They also help give us a social identity. The out-groups are those who are not in the group. These groups can be small, but they can be large enough to encompass uh, also an entire nation. And um, uh, in line with uh, the social identity theory by Teufel and Turner, um, it seems that uh, we have usually uh, negative associations with outgroups. Assuming that our relationship with our in-group is positive. Uh, now obviously some individuals who are living in a specific in-group, could be a country, and they're dissatisfied with this. So obviously there's not going to be an identification with this, and uh, 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 therefore uh, probably an out-group that sort of reflects certain interests, values that uh, I personally hold, but which my culture doesn't hold, I'm going to then obviously see that output more positively. Okay. 
Okay. And if there is a very strong in-group uh, identification, then here again uh, there is a preference, according to the theory, uh, to discriminate in favor of the in-group. The idea being that by discriminating, in a sense, positively towards your in-group, negatively towards the out-group, you are creating a positive social identity within that in-group, that people like you, essentially. Yeah. Attitudes. Attitudes, um, psychological tendencies that are expressed by evaluating a particular entity, could be a person, object, uh, etc., uh, with some degree of favor or disfavor. Usually includes judgments that individuals develop and the evaluative uh, representations of those judgments in memory. Uh, they, they tend to be usually associated with three components as usually said to be a cognitive, affective, and behavioral uh, component. There's some disagreement whether these are separate components or part of one. Uh, on it. But essentially, uh, it is usually said to have had three, although it's difficult to sort of really define attitudes. If you start looking closer, there are some attitudes that seem to be purely cognitive. There are some that seem to be purely affective. Uh, with the effect of one, people are sort of maybe confronted with a large spider. Some of them just react uh, irrationally with a feeling scream. There's not much thinking about this. Uh, they're learned. Okay. And uh, they can fall in any direction. They're also organized in a uh, unique hierarchy to sort of, in a sense, uh, fit into the image that an individual has of the world. They can be changed, but the problem is, as Festinger pointed out, that uh, if the change creates so-called cognitive dissonance, this is uh, going to be actively uh, sort of opposed by an individual. Uh, Festinger proposes that people want to have uh, a worldview in harmony, and if there is dissonance, it creates stress, and stress is bad for most people, therefore they try to avoid it. So this is the problem if you have verbal messages that try to overcome stereotypes or prejudices that go against someone's uh, inner values and beliefs, it's going to co uh, create this cognitive dissonance, and you're not going to get people uh, 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 to sort of go along with your ideas. The problem also is, is that, uh, maybe let me just sort of go a little bit further, uh, that we, we have a problem, uh, it's quite interesting, there was a, uh, um, an experiment was done um, in the early 1960s at the uh, Faculty of Education at the University, we have the link to education again, at Hamburg. I know I'm over time, but I'll do the last one. Uh, the, uh, um, Germany and, um, uh, and France, as all of you know, have had for many, many years uh, lots of conflicts. And after World War II, uh, between West Germany and France, there was an attempt made to overcome some of these, uh, uh, the hatred that exists on both sides. So uh, they figured that, well, we probably can't change the, uh, uh, the older generation. Let's start with children. So they decided to introduce a summer camp to bring uh, school children together. And um, they uh, found out, uh, they, uh, they, they questioned the children, French and the German children, before the summer camp, of the, uh, how they would describe themselves and how they would describe the other uh, uh, group. And they did the same thing after the summer camp, and they found out that the uh, stereotypes and prejudices had actually increased, which surprised them because they hadn't expected that. So they looked at it a little bit further, and um, what do you think happened? Well, they had uh, some uh, sleeping areas where they had the um, uh, German children, they had sleeping areas for the French children, they had a German team playing against the French team in football, tug of war, etc. Uh, what do you think happened? 
Uh, well, th this this competition essentially just uh, something that it was just, they, they were they, they were still maintaining groups and they were just continuing sort of uh, you know uh, us against them the Germans against the French and especially with sports uh, which is highly competitive you're just increasing this uh, so they had to change the strategy on this and this is actually described by uh, Eichert he calls this in the context of organization communication calls this the linking pin function, uh, the next year after they realized what happened is, is they started having mixed teams, uh, mixing Germans and French. Now they had to work together. This seems to work. This uh, sort of coincides also with, uh, with uh, Fishbein's theory of reason action where he says that uh, social peers have a tremendous influence on developing people's attitudes. Uh, Sorry, I didn't have time to go into all the details. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about it later. It's a very, very complex area. So just sort of having messages uh, spread out and directed at people might not work. Okay.